Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope that you can uh, see me and hear me uh, and that somebody will tell me if you can't, because I have no way of knowing. I am just speaking into the ether at the moment, as it were. Um, my name is Nicola Conn. I'm a barrister at 39 Essex Chambers, where I, I hope that you've now got human my rights law slides um, up. So this is a, a brief the majority of the work I do in the court protection today is in the realm of health capacity, and welfare. Although I do do a bit of property and affairs as well. To sex. And the majority of that recent development in, in, in the law uh, concentrates on the area of consent. And I do have to say on that point, we're actually specifically fortunate that whether or not people have phone for my understanding that there are very significant developments to consent. In the law, probably the greatest developments that there have been in the last five or ten years, uh, just in the last couple of months. Uh, I'll briefly touch on the separate tests of, of uh, capacity with regards to contraception, termination and marriage. Uh, and then I'll give a quick look at the rights of, of P and the duties of caregivers. Uh, I've put questions on there because, of course, questions are very welcome. But in fact, what we're going to do is after you've had a whole hour of, um, of law, for which I do apologise, uh, from me, I'm going to hand on straight to uh, a coffee break uh, and then you'll hear um, from uh, the next um, presenters who are going to talk uh, about the, the psychological aspects of, of this question um, and we'll answer questions at the end. So moving swiftly on uh, and framing the debate in, in the recent case of a local authority and JB which I'm going to talk to you about a bit more later Mrs Justice Roberts describes sex as a primal expression of our humanity and existence as sexual beings it is, she said, an essential part of our basic DNA as reproductive human beings. As Hayden Jay and before him Sir Brian Levison have confirmed, sexual relations form a fundamental aspect of our humanity, common to all regardless of whether an individual suffers from some impairment of the mind. The whole process of decision making in this context, even in the case of persons of full capacity, is largely visceral rather than cerebral, owing more to instinct and emotion than to analysis. The Hayden to whom Mrs Justice Roberts refers is more properly Mr Justice Hayden, the Vice President of the Court of Protection, and he was widely quoted in, in the press in May of last year, some of you may remember, um, out of context uh, and with great irresponsibility, as he later argued in the case of NB and Tower Hamlet, saying, I cannot think of any more obviously fundamental human right than the right of a man to have sex with his wife. Of course, what Mr Justice Hayden was saying was not, in fact, a man has a right to have sex with his wife. Rather, he was attempting to demonstrate how fundamentally important an individual's right to a sex life is to him or to her and to his or her autonomy. As another judge put it, sex between humans must involve more than mere animalistic coupling. It is psychologically a big deal to use the vernacular. Now, by definition, those who come within the jurisdiction of the Court of Protection are vulnerable. Due to an impairment of or a disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain, they are people who are unable to make certain decisions for themselves. And as a result, they may fall prey to exploitation. This can take the form of financial abuse, physical abuse or sexual abuse. This vulnerability gives rise to the competing principles with which the law decision makers and care providers need to grapple how to protect the autonomy of a protected party, who we often refer to as P in these cases, a person who lacks capacity to make decisions for themselves, while also keeping P safe. So how do we balance this most fundamental of rights to engage in sexual relations with the need to protect the vulnerable from exploitation? How do we manage the fact that different cultures, age groups, individuals may have widely differing attitudes towards sex? that some may see it as a duty to be performed within the confines of a marriage for the purposes of procreation, while others may see it as a pastime to be enjoyed with multiple partners. How do we manage the reality that sex may be enjoyed quite differently and involve very, diff involve very different kinds of risks for men and women, gay or straight, cisgendered or trans? In addition to this, as the, as the Court of Appeal remarked in JB, a case that I'm going to talk to you about more, that's highly relevant in the Me Too era, there's a third principle in place. And that principle is this, the Mental Capacity Act and the Court of Protection cannot function in a vacuum. They cannot be considered entirely removed from the civil and criminal arenas in which sex can lawfully take place, only in the full and ongoing consent from both partners. 
they have to consider whether or not both parties are consenting. Now, this is, as I hope you're beginning to realise, a very fast developing area of law with two significant cases decided by the Court of Appeal this year, both currently under appeal to the Supreme Court. What I'm going to do over the next hour is take you through some of the background and the history of how this debate, debate has, has evolved, because I, I think and hope it will help you understand where we're up to now. And I'll answer any questions, as I've said at the end. So beginning with the basics. Um, the Court of Protection was created by statute, the Mental Capacity Act 2005, frequently referred to as the MCA. It relates, as I've said already, only to adults over the age of 16. And the jurisdiction of the Court of Protection, or COP, as people often refer to it, extends to decision making only on behalf of individuals who lack the mental capacity to make relevant decisions for themselves. So where an individual is vulnerable, but able to make decisions for him or herself, the Court of Protection cannot exercise its powers. That may be a case in which you need to rely on the inherent jurisdiction of the High Court. And that is a whole other topic uh, on which I'll happily come back and talk to you about another day. But it's important that you recognise and understand the parameters of the jurisdiction of the Court of Protection. The application of the Mental Capacity Act, the MCA, is governed by five overarching principles, which you should have on the slide in front of you first. They are number one, the presumption of capacity. Uh, and these are set out in section one, two of the Act. If you ever want to look at it, it's, it's available online. It's a very, it's a modern Act, so it's quite easy to read and interpret and understand. And section one, two, the, the first principle is that a person must be assumed to have capacity unless it is established that he lacks capacity. This means that the burden of proof lies with the person asserting that he lacks capacity. And you must always be aware that while there is a presumption of capacity, you must guard against an assumption of capacity. The second principle is that a person is not to be treated as unable to make a decision unless all practicable steps have been taken to help him to do so without success. That means that when you're dealing with a, with a person who may be suffering from an impairment or disturbance in the functioning of their mind or brain, you must take all reasonable steps to communicate with them appropriately, to visit them at the right time of the day, to ask them questions in the company of people with whom they feel comfortable, to maximise their decision making ability. Third principle, a person is not to be treated as unable to make a decision merely because he makes an unwise decision. There is a difference between an unwise decision and a decision that he does not have the capacity to make. Number four, any act done must be in P's best interests. A decision is in P's best interest, and I'll come on and explain to you what the best interest principle uh, provides. But again, only where P lacks capacity. If he is found to have capacity, then he must make the decision for him or herself. And finally, the principle of least restriction. That is that before an act is done or a decision is made, regard must be had to whether the purpose for which it is needed can be as effectively achieved in a way that is less restrictive of the person's rights and freedom of action. And this is easiest to understand in the con context of deprivation of liberty, for example. If you need to keep somebody inside to keep them safe, the least restrictive principle would be simply to shut the door rather than to lock them in a room. In this context of decision making, it can be broken down to making sure that P has as much decision making ability for themselves and to facilitate them to make the decision themselves where they can. So what do we mean when we say someone lacks mental capacity? The test is set down in the statute again, it's at section 2.1. For the purposes of the act, a person lacks capacity in relation to a matter if at the material time he is unable to make a decision for himself in relation to the matter because of an impairment of or a disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain. I've bolded some of the, the words in, in that element of the statute because they're worth looking at. Capacity is time specific. It is at the material time. It is decision specific in relation to a matter. P lacks capacity to make a specific decision. It is wrong to say that someone lacks capacity generally, although I'm sure you've all seen that many times. The inability to make decisions is defined under Section 3, and that is that a person is unable to make a decision if they're un unable to understand, retain and use or weigh that information as part of the decision making process and to communicate this decision 
And the element, the fourth element there, communicating the decision, should be, I would suggest, something that very rarely comes in the way of an individual being found to have capacity. Because if you think about it and the principle of all practicable steps being taken to assist somebody in making a decision, if the situation is that P can understand and retain and use and weigh the information, but they simply can't communicate it to, to whoever is, is caring for them, then you need to think about other ways that they might be able to, to demonstrate what they're thinking, whether by pointing at a picture, sign language, uh, demonstration and so on. But the Act goes on to say that regard must be had to whether a person is, has been given um, all the opportunity uh, to understand whether they've been given an explanation of the relevant information in appropriate language. The fact that they can only retain information for a short period of time does not mean that they are unable to make a decision. So as I said before, um, capacity is time and decision specific. And finally, the information relevant to a decision includes information regarding the reasonably foreseeable consequences of deciding one way or another or failing to make a decision. It's important to remember that the question for the court and the decision maker is not whether a person's ability to take the decision is impaired by an impairment of or disturbance in the function of the mind or brain, <clears throat> but rather whether that person is rendered unable to make the decision. We refer as lawyers to something called a causative nexus between the impairment and the lack of capacity. What this means is that it must be because a person suffers from an impairment of or disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain that they're unable to make a relevant decision, not simply that they have learning disabilities and they are struggling to make a decision. One must be the cause of the other, because if you think about it, to find other way otherwise is discriminatory. It sets the bar differently for persons who are disabled than for those who are not. And finally, I'm sure you've all, um, those of you who are involved in capacity assessments, seen reference to the um, infamous blank canvas. The first step when considering whether a person has capacity to make a particular decision is to identify the relevant information that they need to understand, retain, use and weigh. They shouldn't be presented with a blank canvas, but with concrete options from which they might reasonably be able to choose. So, for example, in the case of residents, an elderly individual with dementia shouldn't be asked what sort of ca uh, package of care do you think you might need, but rather do you want to live here at home with this person or do you want to live in this care home here with these people? It's not necessary for a person to be able to use away every single detail of every respective option that might be available to them. Rather, they simply need to understand the salient factors. The assessment of capacity, and I, I do apologise that I can't um, flip between the slides and uh, my face. We, we did try before I um, came online, but it was beyond me. So uh, apologies that um, it's a long, a, a, a long series of slides in front of you. But the assessment of capacity is concerned with how a person makes decisions, um, not the content of the those decisions. So the fact that a person makes a decision that is unwise is not to be used as evidence of a lack of capacity. Um, and there's a helpful quote from Lord Justice McFarlane in the case of PC and NC in the city of York, in which he says, there is a space between an unwise decision and one which an individual does not have the mental capacity to take. And it is important to respect that space and, and to ensure that it is preserved, for it is within that space that an individual's autonomy operates. And in that case, the court was looking at it with regard to uh, a woman who wanted to um, live with a man who was a sex offender and refused to acknowledge the realities of, of his past behaviour. And the court was keen to point out that individuals in ordinary life who have no impairment of their mental functioning often make very foolish decisions with regard to who they enter into a relationship with, who they have sexual relations with. And there must not be a differentiation between those people and people who lack capacity only insofar as the lack of, of mental capacity, the impairment in the function of the mind or brain is the cause of an inability to make um, a relevant decision. Having said that, 
it's very often the fact that a person is making that the fact that a person is making unwise decisions is what prompts a capacity assessment and in fact the code of practice uh, the Medical Capacity Act Code of Practice, with which I'm sure many of you are familiar, um, points out that where a person is repeatedly making unwise decisions that may put them at risk of significant harm or exploitation, it may call for further uh, investigation and indeed a reassessment um, of their capacity. Um, and this is likely to be of significant importance in the context of capacity and sex, um, because it's often only when P's sexual habits become risky or appear to put them in danger that their capacity is in question. So, for example, questions about capacity are far less likely to arise in the context of a, a lengthy and monogamous marriage. And we'll look at that in the case of Tower Hamlets and MB. Then in the context of a young adult with learning disabilities who engages in sex with multiple partners. And again, this is about balancing presumptions and assumptions. Caregivers and decision makers must presume that P has capacity to engage in sex until that presumption is rebutted. But they cannot assume that to be the case where there are indications that P might not have capacity and where there is a danger that P might be exploited. Now, um, I'm not going to deal with this at too great, great lengths. Um, but in cases where uh, P has been determined to lack capacity, decisions then fall to be taken in his or her best interests. The Medical Capacity Act doesn't define best interests per se, but Section 4 of the Act sets out um, the, the relevant issues that must be borne in mind. And these include that a decision as to best interests must not be affected by age, appearance, condition, behaviour. Uh, and excuse the American spelling there, which I've just noticed. Um, and they must consider the likelihood of P having capacity in the future, encourage P to participate in the decision making and consider the past, their past and present wishes and feelings and consult with others. And there is growing uh, case law to the effect that, that par um, wishes and feelings have should have significant um, value, weight placed on them, albeit that there is not yet any hierarchy of best interests. Now, I said I was only going to touch on this briefly, and that is in part because as far as sex is involved, it can never be a best interest decision. Now, that, that's not the same for, for contraception and termination, and we'll come on to that. But where sex and marriage are concerned, and there are a number of other categories in Section 27, which I've not put up there, the court cannot make a decision on behalf of another person. And what this means is that a declaration that someone lacks capacity to consent to sex is very final. So that if, for example, you have an elderly married couple with dementia, the wife's taken into care, the decision maker might determine that the wife lacks capacity to have contact with her husband. And the court can make a best interest, interest declaration there based on her past wishes and views of her others, her children, maybe her values and beliefs that she had a very happy marriage. She loved her husband. It would be in her best interest to continue contact. But the same best interest decision making power does not apply to their sex life. So once there is a declaration that she lacks capacity now to consent to sex, that neither the decision maker nor a court could determine that it was in her best interest to have sex with her husband. So a declaration that P lacks capacity con to consent to sex is a declaration that P cannot lawfully have sex, that any sex with P is unlawful, that it's a criminal act. And it's because of this, as I hope you can understand, the test for capacity to, to consent to sex has historically been set extremely low. So, uh, one of the earliest cases that deals with this is actually a, a, a pre-2005 um, uh, pre MCA case, so it's decided under what was then the inherent jurisdiction. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just drinking water, which you obviously can't see, but uh, it's a case of uh, ex City Council and MB, which is frequently referred to MAB. It's a case of um, Mr Justice Munby. And although it's obiter, um, obiter on the basis that um, all the parties agree that P lack capacity to consent to sex, it's still a test uh, which was relied upon for many years thereafter. Uh, and Mr Justice Mumby said that in order to have capacity to consent to sex, P needed to understand the nature and the character of the act, the mechanics of sex, 
a sufficient rudimentary knowledge of what the act comprises and, and of its sexual character to enable him to give or withhold consent and an understanding of the reasonably foreseeable consequences of the act. Capacity to consent to sex historically uh, and still is act rather than person specific. So P either has capacity to consent to sex with anyone or with no one. And this has brought it into conflict with the criminal law, which is obviously person specific. As Lady Hale said in the House of Lords criminal case, my lords, it is difficult to think of an activity which is more person and situation specific than sexual relations. One does not consent to sex in general. One consents to this act of sex with this person at this time and in this place. But of course, that approach does not fit, I would suggest, naturally with the Court of Protection, which is having to make prospective declarations about an individual's ability to make decisions about an event that may take place with anyone at any time in the future. So, for example, in the case of D Borough Council and B, Mr. Justin Most, Mr. Justice Mostyn was um, concerned with an application regarding a vulnerable adult, Alan, with moderate learning disability who lacked capacity con to consent to sex. Uh, and, and he had regard to Baroness Hell's comment in, in the Crown and Cooper, um, but noted that there was a very considerable practical problem in allowing a partner specific dimension into the test. He said, is the local authority supposed to vet every proposed sexual partner of Alan to gauge if Alan has the capacity to consent to sex with him or her? He concluded that the test for capacity must include only that capacity to consent to sex remains act specific and requires an understanding and awareness of the mechanics of the act, that there are health risks involved, particularly the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases, and that sex between a man and a woman may result in pregnancy. He specifically rejected the proposal by one of the experts in the case that P should understand one, that only adults over 16 should have sex and therefore participants needed to be able to distinguish accurately between adults and children. Two, that both or all parties to the act need to consent to it. And three, that sex is part of having relationships with people and may have emotional consequences. Observing that rapists have the capacity to consent to sex, Mr Justice Mostyn accepted that individuals with learning disabilities needed to be taught about consent, but he said there's a difference between teaching of what is right and wrong in the pursuit of sex and what level of understanding and intelligence is needed to be capable of consenting to it. Now, over the years, the courts, the judges in the Court of Protection have gone back and forth refining the test some including the requirement that P understand that they do have a choice and that they can refuse. And that would include Mr Justice Mostyn, who, who changed his position from, from his earlier views in, in the case of D Borough Council and B. Um, and the act specific approach was endorsed and followed by Mr Justice Baker, as he then was. And when lawyers say, as he then was, in a slightly pompous way. I hope you all know, I, I must confess that I didn't before I was one, uh, that they say that because Mr Justice Baker is now a judge in the Court of Appeal. So he's now Lord Justice Baker. And what this means, of course, is that um, cases in which he has pronounced judgment have a particular significance, arguably. And in the case of, of TZ, a case that concerned a young autistic gay man who wanted to have sex uh, with other people, uh, with other men, other men. Mr Justice Baker suggested that the test should be further modified so that in circumstances where it was established that P only wanted to engage in homosexual sex, understanding that sex between a man and a woman may result in pregnancy was not a requirement of the capacity test. He said, most people faced with the decision whether or not to have sex do not embark on a process of weighing up complex abstract or hypothetical information. He accepted the submission of the official solicitor that the weighing up of the irrelevant information should be seen as a relatively straightforward decision, balancing the risk of ill health and possible pregnancy of the relations of heterosexual with pleasure, sexual and emotion brought about by intimacy. There is a danger that the imposition of a higher standard for capacity may discriminate against people with a mental impairment. Now, one of the issues in TZ and a number of cases that have come before the Court of Protection is how to manage instances where P has capacity to consent to sex, 
but lacks capacity to determine with whom he or she should have contact. Now, at first blush, this seems like a ludicrous position. How could you have capacity to have sex with someone, but not have capacity to decide to meet them for a cup of coffee afterwards? Now, the test for capacity to consent to sex set out in cases like TZ has been set low. Mechanics, sex between a man and a woman can lead to pregnancy, possibility of sexually transmitted diseases. The test for contact, however, is much more complex. Um, and I've just looked, but I haven't got the slide up for that there, but it comes from a judgment of, of Mrs. Justice Tyson, in the case of LBX. Uh, and it includes that P must understand the information that P must understand, retain, use and weigh, which is relevant to a decision on contact is who the person is with whom they might wish to have contact and in broad terms, the nation of their nature of their relationship what sort of contact they could have with each of them, including different locations, different durations, different arrangements, the presence of a support worker, the positive and negative aspects of having contact with each person, what the impact of deciding to have or not have contact with a particular sort of person might be, and that family are a different category, so people need to understand what a family relationship is. This is obviously a much higher threshold than the very low threshold of capacity to consent to sex, hence the sex but no coffee scenario. Now in TZ number two, the court allowed for this possibility by concluding that TZ, who was a young gay man with autism, um, had capacity to consent to sex, but lacked capacity to decide whether a man with whom he might wish to have sex was safe. And this was managed by way of a care plan, which allowed him to go to nightclubs with care workers who would help him make decisions about whether or not an individual was safe before allowing him to go off with them. And Mr Justice Baker said the local authority and the court are under a positive obligation to ensure that he, TZ, is supported in having a sexual relationship should he wish to do so, but also to ensure as far as possible that he is kept safe from harm. The purpose of the plan is therefore to identify the support to be provided to assist him in developing a sexual relationship without exposing him to harm. Now, I would be cautious about following this model too closely in practice. Um, in the 2018 case of Manchester and LC, um, of Manchester and LC a judge at first instance sanctioned a plan, a care plan, which permitted P, a 23 year old woman with um, autistic spectrum disorder and learning disabilities, who was married but expressed a wish to have sex with multiple partners, to engage in sex with people at home. And this is how uh, the press reacted. Uh, and um, Mr Justice Hayden, uh, of course, how the press reacts to a case should not determine how decisions are made. But it's worth noting that the judge in that case, Mr Justice Hayden, the Vice President of the Court of Protection, observed that in all cases where there is a conflict between com competing domains of capacity, such that there are necessary restrictions on an area where P did have capacity, because LC was considered to have capacity to consent to sex, but not to contact, Cases should be heard in the High Court rather than the District Court or, or uh, rather than before District or Circuit Court judges sitting as judges of the Court of Protection. And I would suggest that whenever uh, a care plan in the TZ terms is contemplated, that very serious thought is given to the implications uh, that that might lead to. Now, all of the cases that I've been talking about have been high court decisions, none binding on the other, and they resulted in real confusion due to the lack of consensus that they presented. Did P need to understand that he had a right to say no or not? How far did his understanding of the importance of pregnancy uh, need to go? The first case, time that the, the issue came before the Court of Appeal, uh, in a, in a case that attempted to reconcile these competing authorities is the case of IM and LM. And this was a case concerning LM, uh, a woman with a diagnosis of, of hypoxic brain injury in the context of a long standing problem with alcohol and a history of drug abuse and prostitution. The Court of Appeal was tasked with determining her capacity to consent to sex in the context of an appeal by her mother regarding the management of her, her daughter's sexual relationship with her former partner who had a significant criminal history. And the capacity evidence suggested that P uh, 
uh, LM understood the mechanics of the sexual act and that heterosexual sex can lead to pregnancy and the risk of STIs. Um, but she did not understand or was unable to weigh up the advantages and disadvantages of becoming pregnant or the potential health risks of falling pregnant. Um, endorsing the prior approaches of various High Court judges that the test for capacity to consent to sex was general and issue specific rather than person or um, event specific and thus fundamentally different from the criminal law. The Court of Appeal said that the notional decision making process attributed to the protected person regarding consent to sexual relations should not become divorced from the actual decision making process carried out in that regard by persons of full capacity. So that there has to be a limit on what needs to be envisaged as the reasonable foreseeable consequences of a particular decision because people of full capacity uh, powers don't necessarily think through every single consequence of the decision to have sex with somebody. The Court of Appeal said decision making is a largely visceral rather than cerebral process owing more to instinct and emotion than to analysis and the ability to use and weigh information albeit a mandatory and relevant consideration is unlikely to loom large in the evaluation of capacity to consent to sexual relations. The Court of Appeal also observed that since the, the information typically regarded by persons of full capacity is relevant to the decision whether to consent to sexual relations is relatively limited, the temptation to expand that field of information in an attempt to simulate more widely informed decision making is likely to lead to a paternalism and a derogation from personal autonomy. So they specifically upheld the judgment at first instance was that which was that Ellen had capacity to consent to sex on the basis that she understood the rudiments of the sexual act. She had a basic understanding of the issues of contraception and she had a basic understanding of the risks of sexually transmitted diseases. Significantly, the Court of Appeal did not consider that the understanding of consent, that P understood that she had a choice and could say no, they did not find that that was a fundamental element of the capacity test. Um, and this this aspect of 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 the test or the absence of it um, came under criticism from from judges that followed, notably Mr Justice Cobb in the case of Derbyshire, when he noted the importance of the element of the test that had previously been identified, namely that the person whose capacity is in question understands that they do have a choice and that they can refuse. And this was revisited in the case of a local authority in B. Uh, which came before the court last year and concerned the case of, of B, a, a 31 year old woman with learning disabilities and epilepsy who wished to cohabit with a man known as Mr C. Mr C was in his 70s with convictions for multiple sexual offences um, and he was aware of, of B's learning disabilities and described her as a functioning 10 year old and said he wanted to marry her. B refused to believe Mr C's history of offences and said she wanted to live with him and have his baby. There was also evidence in the case uh, that B was engaging with strangers online uh, and behaving uh, in a way that exposed herself to harm. One of the issues with, with, with which Mr Justice Cobb grappled at first instance was the possibility of overlapping and competing areas of capacity. The capacity is decision specific so that P might have capacity to consent to sex but not to decide on contact with the person with whom she might then engage in intercourse. And on the matter of, of capacity to consent to sex, he held the, the test to include the nature and character of the act, the reasonable foreseeable consequences of intercourse, namely pregnancy, the opportunity to say no, the risk of, of sexually transmitted diseases and the fact that the risk of sexually transmitted diseases can be reduced by taking precautions. Both sides appealed um, so that that case went to uh, the Court of Appeal. But before it could go to the Court of Appeal, before it was heard, another case um, came before the Vice President, Mr Justice Hayden, Tower Hamlets and MB. And that's the case I referred to right at the beginning of this talk, the uh, uh, no more fundamental right than a man's right to have sex with his wife. This case concerned the capacity of a, a woman with learning disabilities to consent to sex with her husband of some 27 years. In the widely publicised interim, interim judgment uh, that he might have sex with your wife uh, judgment, um, Mr Justice Hayden noted that while capacity to consent to sex was to be assessed on a general basis, 
there was really only one person with whom it was contemplated that Envy would be having sex, that is her husband. And therefore the assessment of her capacity in general terms was entirely artificial. Why should she need to understand the possibility of sex leading to STIs if she was an entirely in an entirely monogamous relationship? Why should she need to understand that sex between a man and a woman could lead to pregnancy if she were past the age of fertility? Now, while NB was still under consideration, uh, the Court of Appeal judgment in the case of local authority and B came out. And the Court of Appeal said there um, that the information relevant to the decision whether to consent to sexual relations included the risk of catching a sexually transmitted disease and should include uh, the issue of, of whether or not P understood that they had a right um, to change their mind and that they could say no. But the court also warned significantly against reliance on any list or guideline of information that would be relevant within the meaning of Section 3 of the Mental Capacity Act. It said such lists are no more than guidance to be expanded, contracted or otherwise adapted to the facts of the particular case. And I apologise because, of course, I've just spent the last half an hour telling you all about all the lists of things that P does or doesn't need to understand in order to uh, have the requisite capacity to make a decision. But in fact, the courts are coming round to the idea that this needs to be tailored to some extent to fit the facts of a particular case. The Court of Appeal also upheld the local authorities' appeal, which was against the fact that Mr Justice Cobb at first instance had held that B had capacity to decide where to live uh, on the basis that she could understand the information relevant to whether or not to live with, with Mr C, but that she lacked capacity to make decisions regarding her care and her contact and capacity to consent to sex because she didn't understand all the information relevant to that. She couldn't understand retain, use and weigh the fact that Mr C was a sex offender. She couldn't understand uh, that sex could lead to an STI because she thought that if you washed, you couldn't pass on a sexually transmitted disease. And the Court of Appeal said agreed with the local authorities appeal on the basis that separating capacity into self-contained silos without regard to how they overlapped couldn't meet the statutory test for capacity, which includes the reasonably foreseeable consequences of a decision. But it's easy to understand if you think about it. How can you understand what care you need? How can you be said to understand the reasonably foreseeable consequences of choosing to live alone with a sex offender without access to outside care if you can't understand the care that you need? And by virtue of, of uh, his conclusion at first instance that B could decide um, her residence, the Court of Appeal said this made B the de facto decision maker with regard to her care and contact and all the other things. And so it couldn't stand. Now, in light of the judgment in local authority and B, uh, Mr Hayden, um, Mr Justice Hayden looked again at the question of capacity to consent to sex um, in the Tower Hamlets case. And he said, it's not the objective of the Mental Capacity Act to pamper or to nurse make the incapacitous. Rather, it is to provide the fullest experience of life and with all its, with all of it, its vicissitudes. This must be kept in focus when identifying the appropriate criteria for assessing capacity. It's not to be regarded as applicable only to a consideration of best interests. So having spent years honing the list of what information P does or does not now, does, does or does not need to understand, retain, use and weigh, the Court of Appeal now appears to be telling us that it's all guidance and that it needs to be tailored or contracted to fit the facts of any particular case. Because in, in the NB case, and of course that's not the Court of Appeal, but that's coming after and interpreting and applying uh, the case law of the Court of Appeal, Mr Justice Hayden was saying that it's important to incorporate P's particular circumstances and characteristics so that while the test can rightly be characterised as issue specific in the sense that the key criteria will remain inevitably objective, there will on occasions be a subjective or person specific context to their application. That is not, however, quite the last word. Um, at the same time as this debate on the subjective rather than the objective nature of the test has been brewing, 
the courts have also been considering the question not just of peace capacity to understand that he has a choice or she has a choice and can say no, but also the importance of peer understanding that their intended partner can consent and is in fact consenting. And this is the local authority and JB. This was a case that was in the press quite a lot this year, so you may be familiar with it. This case concerned JB, a 36 year old man with autistic spectrum disorder, impaired cognition and severe epilepsy. Interestingly, he was not learning disabled, but he had marked problems in adaptive functioning and social interactions and Asperger's syndrome. He lived in supported living uh, and arrangements were made to, to keep him from social interactions, which gave him access to women, particularly the learning disabled or the vulnerable. But he was fixated on wanting a girlfriend and wanting to have sexual relations. And he would fixate specifically on individual women and send them repeated, unwanted, sexually explicit, explicit messages. He would approach women while they were dancing, while out, and his carers feared that in the absence of an appropriate control, he posed a significant risk of rape. A number of assessments were carried out by a clinical psychologist and JB, when he was questioned about it, defined consent as one party allowing the other party to have sex without the other party complaining. When presented with the scenario of a woman drunk at a party who had had sex with one man, JB said that she would obviously then be fair game for anyone else. He clearly didn't appreciate that someone could withdraw consent previously given. And when this suggestion was presented to him by the psychologist, it was noted that he appeared visibly shaken by this idea. The psychologist in the case concluded that he had a very poor understanding of the emotional state or intentions of others, and that there was a high risk of him committing a sexual assault in pursuit of sexual relationship. And therefore, she concluded that he lacked capacity to consent to sex. The official solicitor, however, who was instructed on P's behalf, said quite correctly at the time with regard to the law, the legal test for capacity to consent to sex required only understanding of the mechanics of the act, understanding of the health risks, understanding that the, the, uh, sex between a man and a woman could lead to, to pregnancy. It didn't require an understanding of the other party's intentions. So the official solicitor said, well, you should re review your conclusion on this basis of the case law. Psychologists did, and the conclusion was that JB had capacity to consent to sex. The local authority at this point brought the matter before Mrs Justice Roberts uh, in the Court of Protection. And she was asked to resolve the single question that you have on the slide there. Does the information relevant to the decision within Section 3.1 of the Mental Capacity Act include the fact that the other person engaged in sexual activity must be able to and does, in fact, from their words and conduct, consent to such activity? Mrs Justice Roberts um, came to the conclusion that for the purposes of determining the fundamental capacity of an individual in relation to sexual relations, the information relevant to the decision for the purposes of Section 3.1 of the MCA does not include information that absent consent of a sexual partner attempting sexual relations with another person is liable to breach the criminal law. She adopted the formulation posited by the official solicitor, which was sex is a largely visceral rather than cerebral act, no more to instinct and emotion than to analysis. So the declaration re remained uh, that, that JB had capacity to consent to sex and a care plan was authorised for close supervision and a programme of treatment and education to improve his social awareness and mitigate the risks to others. The local authority appealed to the Court of Appeal and in June of this year, the Court of Appeal handed down judgment reversing the decision of Mrs Justice Roberts and concluding that JB lacked capacity. Well, and that's where we pause, because in fact, what the Court of Appeal did was it changed the question. So the question that the, the Court of Appeal answers is not whether JB has capacity to consent to sex, but whether JB had the capacity to engage in sex. 
she couldn't articulate any reason why she was opposed to an IUD, so to say it's my body and I don't want it. And the trust application was unopposed by her litigation friend, the official solicitor. And what the case, uh, and, and ultimately Mrs Justice Leaven in that case, uh, made a declaration that it was in her best interest to have an IUD fitted. Um, what that case demonstrates is that contraception, unlike sex, is a decision on which the court may make a best interest decision. And the courts also have in the past made declarations that the covert use of contraception, i.e. without P knowing, may also be in their best interest. But they've also warned that in those circumstances, such, such action should only be countenanced in exceptional circumstances. And if such an issue um, ever arises, it is always important uh, to make an application to court promptly uh, and as soon as, as the issue arises. Uh, I've given you on the next slide um, the test for capacity to consent to termination, which is the case of SB. Uh, and that was a, a woman with, um, I think, schizophrenia um, who wanted and was ultimately granted a termination despite having intentionally conceived a child with her husband. Um, it, it's it's a, an extemporary judgment of Mr Justice Holden, Holman, but it's still um, consistently referred to in the case. But I think it's important to remember that the reality is in, in this area of law in particularly, capacity to consent to a termination is likely to be extremely fact specific. Um, and a best interest case on termination was again in the press a lot last year, AB, uh, which concerned a 24 year old woman with, with learning disabilities who had become pregnant while staying with family um, abroad. And her, her devoutly Catholic mother was resolutely against abortion. Um, but initially presented her daughter AB at a hospital at 16 weeks pregnant, saying that she couldn't cope both with AB and a baby. So that the hospital made an application for um, a declaration that AB lacked capacity, which was not opposed, but also a declaration that it would be in her best interest to have a termination. And while this was granted at first instance by Mrs Justice Leaven, it went to the Court of Appeal, who again, um, uh, made the decision on the basis of the facts, it seems to me, that there was insufficient weight um, given at first instance, at instance to AB's own wishes and feelings. The fact that she said that she wanted a baby and the Court of Appeal said in the end, the evidence taken as a whole was simply not sufficient to justify the profound invasion of AB's rights represented by the non-consensual termination of this advanced pregnancy. Again, I think it's hard to think of a scenario in which both capacity and best interests um, should be more tailored uh, to the individual facts of the case than this. But another warning in this case uh, is the importance of bringing an early application to court. The uh, capacity to consent to marry, um, it's an, a very old case, Sheffield City Council and E, but it still remains good law. Um, understanding the nature of the, of the marriage contract and understanding the duties and responsibilities of marriage to live together, to love one another as husband and wife and to share in a common home. I have myself made submissions uh, to the effect that this is quite um, outdated, but I haven't yet succeeded in convincing um, a court of that. But again, as with capacity to consent to sex, capacity to marry is act rather than person specific. Um, and just finally, uh, when making an assessment of capacity, it's important that all practicable steps are taken uh, to maximise P's capacity. And I've given you a reference there for a case of CH and Metropolitan Council, which is a case concerning a learning disabled man uh, against whom a declaration was made that he lacked capacity to consent to sex with his wife, the local authority having failed to provide him with basic sex education uh, for which they were um, he was awarded £20,000 worth of damages. Now, I'm going to finish in five minutes, but I'm just going to very, very briefly, because I'm running out of time as as, as per, whenever barristers ask by court, how long will submissions be? They will say, oh, just 10 minutes, my Lord, never is. Uh, but I'm going to try and very quickly um, just take you through some other uh, very brief issues, which is the issue of access to prostitution. Um, and this is looked at in the case of Mr Justice Keane, 
in the case of Lincolnshire and AB, uh, where AB was a 51 year old man with, uh, with an autistic spectrum disorder and moderate learning disabilities. He wanted care workers to uh, facilitate in travelling to Amsterdam to visit prostitutes. And Mr Justice Keane refused to sanction the plan. He noted the danger of care workers causing or reciting sexual activity being a breach of the Sexual Offences Act. And he said as a matter of pol public policy, it was not a plan that he would endorse. He said it would be wholly contrary to public policy for this court and for this local authority to endorse and sanction P having sexual relations with a woman for payment. And in any event, notwithstanding P's clearly expressed wishes and his clear desires to continue to meet prostitutes for sexual activity, I do not consider it in his best interest to do so. Now, this case was decided with reference to the Sexual Offences Act, Section 39 of which makes it an offence to incite or cause an individual with a mental disorder to engage in sexual activity and section 53a which makes it an offence to pay for sexual services of a prostitute subjected to force and section 53a is significant because it's a strict liability offence which means it doesn't matter whether you meant to commit it or not something in criminal law known as mens rea if you if you if you break it a criminal act uh, uh, is made out and it's made out if A makes or promises a payment for the sexual service of a prostitute, person B, and a third person is engaged in exploitative conduct of a kind likely to induce or encourage B to provide the sexual services for which A has been promised payment, i.e. has trafficked them, has pimped them, has coerced them, has threatened them. Um, and C engaged in that conduct for or in the expectation of gain for C or another person. And it doesn't matter where in the world this uh, act takes place, where in the world the sexual services are provided. So that the point being that if care work workers had taken AB to Amsterdam to have sex with a prostitute and unbeknownst to them, the prostitute with whom he had sex had been trafficked, then a section that 53A offence would be made out. Um, it's important to remember when we're looking at this case that outside the scope of Section 53A, paying for sex per se, while morally questionable, is not unlawful. Uh, and the fact that P lacks capacity to make relevant decisions can't be used as some kind of minority report moral corrective to prevent them from doing wrong in future. Um, and there has been a great deal of criticism of this judgment and legal in legal and academic circles. Uh, much to my chagrin because I was counsel in the case uh, and it's therefore unsurprising that it's not the last word on the matter and another case is expected before Mr Justice Hayden I believe this term in which the case in which the parties are going to argue um, that where he has capacity to, to consent to sex and decide to see a sex worker it is lawful for care workers to take steps to facilitate that um, so again watch this space. I, I suspect that more prosaic uh, circumstances are likely to present themselves to most of you, which is how to facilitate sex between the elderly in a care home, how to facilitate sex between, you know, young individuals uh, with learning disabilities, living in supported living. Uh, and in those circumstances, I can um, point you towards uh, got re re relatively recent guidance for both the CQC and the RCN, both of which provide very uh, helpful uh, pointers on how to manage these. And in particular, the CQC guidance has an appendix to the report, uh, which includes a list of, of useful resources aimed at facilitating intimacy and sexuality for those in adult social care. So um, I think, I hope you can see me again. Uh, and um, that's it from me. I'll answer any questions that you might have uh, after you've heard from uh, Sonia uh, and Emma.